Little Britches, Father and I Were Ranchers. Chapter 7. I Become a Horseman. Father and mother must have sat up and talked nearly all of that night. I woke just as the moon was slipping down behind the mountains, and there was still a light burning in the kitchen. Mother had brought some garden seed from New England and had bought more at Fort Logan. The next day, she let me stay home from school and help her plant peas and potatoes and carrots and beets. We dug trenches most of the forenoon. Then Mother sent me to shovel the horse manure from behind the barn onto the wagon so Father could haul it out for us at noon when he came home from plowing. Mother had me put manure in the bottom of the trenches and cover it with an inch or two of dirt. Then she laid in cut pieces of potato and hoed dirt over them. We were right in the middle of it when I looked up and saw half a dozen cowboys riding by on the wagon road. I waved, and one of them turned his horse and came cantering across the prairie to where we were. I knew him as soon as he got near enough for me to see his face. He was the same cowboy who had given me the ride. He flipped out of the saddle while his horse was sliding to a stop and took his hat off to Mother with a sort of half bow. I see you folks are really getting dug in. We were scared the big wind might have blowed you clean out of the country. While he was talking to Mother, I was looking at his horse. It was a blue roan, the first one I'd ever seen. Yes, we're here to stay, Mother said. My husband is going to build a storm cellar so there won't be any danger of our being blown clean away. I wished Mother hadn't said clean away. It sounded the way she did when she didn't like somebody, and I wanted her to like my cowboy friend. I walked around the roan and looked at him from the other side while Mother and my cowboy kept talking. Mother didn't talk much, but the cowboy said, Lady, you're sure wasting your time burying these barn cleanings under your spuds. You're due to get tops enough without it. All you got to have for this ground is water, and God help the man that ain't got it. The hair on the blue horse was shinier than it was on Cousin Phil's prints. It rippled like oily water when he moved the muscles under it. To me, it was like a magnet. I had to touch it with my hand, so I stepped up close to his shoulder. Just as I reached my hand up, the cowboy called, Hey, partner, watch out. You're on the offside. Come on around here. While I was coming around, he said to Mother, this old cayuse is clever as a kitten if you stay on the nice side, but he might kick the stuffing out of him over on the off side. He had ground tied the roan by just dropping the reins where he got off. He picked them up while he was talking and passed them around the horse's neck. Then he caught me by one arm and swung me into the saddle. How about a little ride, puncher? he asked. Mother thought he was just going to lead the horse around a little with me on it, and she didn't say anything except be careful when he was showing me how to stick my feet into the loops of strap that held the stirrups. As soon as I got them in, he passed me the lines and clucked. The roan went off in a smooth, easy canter, and Mother cried, No, no, he'll fall! My friend laughed, and I could hear him say, Aw, oh, shucks, if he falls, the ground to catch him. It didn't. At first, I held onto the saddle horn with one hand. The ground seemed so much further away than it did when I was riding a donkey but I didn't feel a bit as though I was going to fall off. So I let go and waved back to Mother and my cowboy. The only time I was frightened at all was when I went to turn him around to go back. We'd gone clear out by the railroad, and I was afraid he might fall down going across, so I pulled to the left rein, but he swung around to the right. For just a second, I thought I was going to take a header, but I kicked out hard with my left foot and was back in balance again. I could see Mother was peeved when we came cantering in. Her mouth was pinched up that way. For just a second, I thought about seeing if I could flip off as my friend did when he came, but the ground was a long way down, and I was scared to try it. Anyway, my feet were stuck in the loops. He reached up and took me off while Mother stood with her hands on her hips. She looked at me with that look of hers that said, Come here, young man, and I went. She didn't say a word to me, but her eyes blazed at the cowboy as if she would like to skin him. You might have killed him, she said. If he'd fallen off, that horse would have trampled him to death. He just laughed. <laughs> no, ma'am, that old pony wouldn't kill nobody. If he'd fell off, old Blue would have just stood there and waited for him to pick himself up. You watch. Then he said to me, 
Didn't have no trouble with him, did you, little britches? I said, no, only he don't steer very good. I pulled the reins to make him go one way, and he went the other. He laughed again. <laughs> He's just rain-wise, and you ain't, that's all. Now you watch. Then he turned around toward Mother, took his big hat off, and said, you watch too, ma'am, and you'll see how safe he is. He kicked up one leg and flew right into the saddle without ever touching the stirrup. He whistled between his teeth as he went up, and Blue was gone with his feet kicking chunks of sod out behind him. The roan had hardly gone 50 feet before he sat right down on his hind legs and skidded. Then the cowboy made him do more tricks than an organ grinder's monkey. They turned round and round in a circle and from one side to the other so that it looked like dancing. Then he would run a little way, full tilt, and be turned around before he got through sliding. I noticed that the cowboy never did pull on either rein. He just held them in his left hand up over the horse's neck, and whichever way he moved his hand, that was the way the roan went. Then he did one that made mother and me both squeal. With the pony going lickety larrup, the cowboy fell right out of the saddle. He lit on the back of his shoulders, turned a half somersault, and came up on his feet. The horse stopped so fast, they were standing there side by side as if they were just waiting for the mailman to come along. The cowboy looked around at mother and took off his hat. It had stayed on all the way through the somersault. He stepped back into the saddle again and trotted over to where we were. First he said to me, catch on little britches. Then he took off his hat to mother again and said, Hiram Beckman's the name, they call me Hi. As he raced back toward the road, he turned and waved his hat. Mother and I waved back. I could hardly wait for father to come in from the field to tell him about Hi and his blue roan horse. Father had been plowing way over across the tracks, and I didn't think he'd noticed us, because he never stopped to look when I could see him. I ran out to meet him when he came and got all mixed up. I was trying to tell him so fast. He put his hand out and rumpled up my hair. I didn't know what he meant, but he said, I guess you're a chip off the old chopping block. If you understand them, you never have any trouble making them understand you. You did all right on that horse. I knew you weren't afraid by the way he was acting. He walked along a little way, then he rumpled up my hair again and said, Your father was proud of you, son. It was the first time he'd ever told me that, and I got a lump in my throat. Then he told me that Hi might be a little bit of a show-off, but he was a good horseman. Not so much because he could fall off and come up on his feet, but because he'd been patient in training Blue. He said that Blue wasn't a bit afraid of Hi, or he wouldn't have handled him so smoothly and that it was the best example he'd ever seen of complete understanding between a man and a horse. If you want to be a good horseman, he said, the first thing you'll have to learn will be how a horse thinks, and next, to think the same way yourself. And we'll pause here and finish this chapter up next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.